Okay, am I good? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the first lecture of the SAMP Fall 2021 lecture series. While this series does not have a common theme, I'm thinking of it as very interesting lectures from very interesting professionals. We have a great lineup this semester, and I hope that all of you will take advantage of the additional exposure and knowledge that you can glean through participating. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce Fred Lippert. Fred has been a wonderful contributor to the Graduate Department of Landscape Architecture over the years, participating in a joint studio in the spring of 2016, and is a frequent juror on studio reviews thereafter. Fred is a professional landscape architect with over a decade of experience in urban design, landscape architecture, and transportation site design. This experience has fostered a design sense that seeks the critical balance between the technical, ecological, and artistic components of our built and natural environments. Fred is currently the director of the Baltimore Office of Tool Design, and he'll be speaking about raging roads, how street design enforces inequality and hides racist policies in plain sight. Please join me in welcoming Fred Lippert. Fred? All right, thank you, Sarah. I will share my screen here. And hopefully everyone is seeing that now. Yes. All right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, just as Sarah said, uh, my name is Fred Lippert and I am the director of the Baltimore office for tool design. And There we go. I am really happy to be here and speaking with you all. And I wanna start off by recognizing the scholarship of these three authors. Uh, one of which you might recognize as a former professor of this very institution. Their collective work, even in just these three books are wonderful resources in understanding how inequities in our built environment were constructed upon a foundation of racism and these authors have worked hard to reveal how this was done in plain sight. And I really encourage you to check them out. You know, a former professor of mine, John Stilgo, would emphasize that the built environment is a sort of palimpsest, a document in which one layer of writing has been scraped off and another one has been applied. He would remind us that a mindful design and planning professional who trains themselves to look closely at things and put some thought into their spatial context or arrange them in time would be rewarded with seeing all sorts of traces of past generations. This becomes especially critical for those of us working in the transportation field as objects and even landscapes from the past have shaped our lives and continue to shape them still today. Behold in front of us, the oh so ordinary do not enter sign. Two of them in fact, in case you missed the first one. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever traveled on Greenmount Ave or York Road, from roughly East 35th Street to East Cold Spring Lane, you may have noticed that many of the streets are posted in such this way. Those familiar with this section of Greenmount or York Road will know that the neighborhood to the east or just beyond those signs is Guilford. A quick survey of four out of the five roads leading into the Guilford neighborhood are posted with do not enter signs. For the careful observer, this raises questions. Why might this be significant? Why does this street grid seem more dense to the west or right side of York Road? Wouldn't these restrictions mean that heavier traffic concentrates on York Road? And wait, doesn't York Road host a city link bus as well as a local link bus route? How does this additional car traffic affect their ability to stay on schedule? Sometimes scrutinizing even the most ordinary things can help us make sense of others and even great historical movements. Some of you might recognize the colorful map as the 1937 residential security map or the map that brought us redlining. But the history of government-sponsored housing segregation started even earlier 
with Baltimore City Ordinance 610. For a deeper dive, look up blockbusting. While it would be ruled unconstitutional in 1917, private Baltimore communities, like the Roland Park community's Guilford development, instituted community covenants that restricted Black people from moving into the neighborhood. Starting as early as 1913, these private restrictive covenants would not be struck down by the Supreme Court until 1948. So what does this have to do with streets? Well, we're going to see how inequities that are rooted in the built environment can persist and remain in forms that are the result of small decisions and relatively ordinary means. One neighborhood's ability to deny full use and access of the street system means that a transit corridor might see higher volumes of traffic and less reliable commute times. As transportation professionals, we face constant opportunities to either dismantle or perpetuate inequities. We must be able to recognize them and use our work to make the world more equitable. You know, equity's importance is rooted in real daily struggles that will persist until they are fully addressed. And I want to recognize as well that countless people, many of them most affected by injustices, have been working towards equity for a long time. That last example was of a very fine scale where a simple street sign could lead us on a little journey into the what and why of what came before. But we also see how even a small scale decision can be a link to much larger issues. We cannot forget though, or lose sight of the fact that real people and communities were and are still affected by these decisions and designs, and that they reverberate through the generations. So it's important to take a moment and let's calibrate our eyes to what was lost. Before you is Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. These were predominantly Black neighborhoods in Detroit with an estimated 350 thriving Black-owned businesses and a vibrant community that supported them and they were raised for Interstate 75. Again, restrictive covenants and deeds prevented black home ownership in a majority of Detroit, except for a couple small enclaves where overcrowding was inevitable as a result of the great migration from the South where it saw men and women escape Jim Crow laws only to find different racist policies. Thus, the racist policy of restrictive deeds begat another racist policy focused on building conditions, and that was called slum clearance, where expressways, highways, freeways were designed for high rates of speed in and out of city centers and used as an excuse to divide and oftentimes literally wipe Black communities off the map. But this didn't just happen in Detroit. Here we are in Baltimore and the planning documents for the 1960s interstates routing and one in particular, which we now call the infamous highway to nowhere, cutting through the heart of West Baltimore. Notice how the planning documents focus on the quality of dwellings and not on the number of potentially displaced people. The keen observer might begin to question why there are so many dwellings listed as poor or fair. The same observer might recall colorful maps that brought us the term redlining and the racist policy of slum clearance in Detroit. One might even be tempted to think that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 solved this issue until one looks into who was targeted as a part of the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. I like this photograph as it really shows the scale and intentionality of the damage done by the highway to nowhere. This is Baltimore. And if we're gonna truly address this damage, 
we're going to need to bring the same level of intentionality to the solution. As I said earlier, we face constant opportunities to dismantle or perpetuate inequalities. We must recognize those opportunities and work to make the world a more equitable place. And, you know, recognizing them is not always easy. Sometimes they are not as large and obvious as this. Sometimes it is precisely this large scale that allows the inequities to hide in plain sight. And when it's something that's so large and ubiquitous, I mean, just so commonplace that we eventually become desensitized to it. For an example, in ecology, where a monoculture such as growing only one crop throws the ecological system out of balance and risks failure, a transportation system that privileges car owners over people who maybe walk, bike, or use transit affects more than just their ability to get around, but also the vitality of neighborhoods and the city as a whole. Fortunately, Tool Design is on two incredible teams working on some exciting projects right here in Baltimore City. The first project's team is led by James Corner Field Operations, where they are working to reimagine Middle Branch. The next couple of slides are some of the team's incredible work and great graphics to display and understand how issues of mobility and transportation affect people's ability to connect not only with their waterfront park, but how mobility can enable access to jobs and opportunity in general. So inside the study area shown on that last slide, we have 19 neighborhoods. And when they're mapped at their simple boundaries, they seem pretty contiguous, pretty connected. But we've also seen how car-dominated transportation infrastructure can divide, isolate, and not only not serve the communities immediately adjacent to them, but actively harm them. Is it any wonder that the highest rates of asthma hospitalization and poor air quality are found here. Even more importantly, we know that locations chosen to site this infrastructure has often had racist policies at its core and disproportionately affect the predominantly black neighborhoods. So here we see the resulting islands of some of these large scale barriers. It's also critical to remember as well how these barriers and isolation can happen at multiple scales from say the width of a sidewalk, if a sidewalk exists at all, to the larger scale barriers that limit or create dangerous street crossing opportunities for whole neighborhoods. Take the communities of Lakeland, Mount Winians, and Westport. While 295 is the obvious barrier, it's when we consider how someone who does not own a car can access the waterfront, the life-threatening inequities reveal themselves. This may sound like an exaggeration, but we will see how the allocation of space is decidedly one-sided and definitely dangerous. All of these neighborhoods, most direct route to the waterfront is via Waterview Ave. Although true access would provide not only a pleasant journey, but a safe and comfortable one. And this journey is certainly not that at all. Beyond being limited to just the single crossing over 295, these three neighborhoods must negotiate narrow, obstructed sidewalks that quite literally end. See that red dot on the right photo? It's gonna leave you right there by the roadside. The design of this street forces you to make a dangerous crossing with a limited vision of who might be speeding around that corner over to an equally threatening situation on the other side where cars are exiting 
onto the street from 295. Understanding how these neighborhoods are isolated in such this way becomes key to ensuring that a reimagined middle branch is created first and foremost as a connected part of the communities that surround it. A second exciting project that Tool Design is fortunate to be on, another outstanding team, is the Druid Lake Vision Plan. This team is led by the incredibly talented folks over at Unknown Studio. Their project comes after this massive infrastructure project to relocate the drinking water of Druid Lake into these large underground tanks. And that once completed, there is going to be incredible opportunities for a major update to Druid Park, the third oldest park in the US. The Unknown Studio team has been hard at work coming up with an incredible plan. And so as not to steal any of their thunder, and they're having a public meeting even today, I will just show this image as a preview of what is to come from living shorelines to swimming areas, to boating, to restored walking and biking loops. This plan is very special, but even better than these amenities, this team recognized immediately upon starting work that this vision plan could only be successful if the community closest to it could have a safe and comfortable access and connection. Far too long, the roads bordering the park have created a dangerous barrier, such as Druid Park Lake Drive, that prevents the surrounding communities from accessing their park. Druid Park Lake Drive's corridor, modern incarnation as a commuter focused, high speed, motor vehicle prioritized roadway, really began with the creation of the Druid Hill Expressway project in 1948. Even before the interstate highway projects of the 60s, we saw white car owning commuters being prioritized and the built environment being shaped to accommodate them. In 1948, the black and Jewish communities correctly recognized that creating an expressway was going to be detrimental. I think what's especially interesting is just how correct both of these quotes are. The new road in quotes or the expressway through the park as described by the deputy director of public works absolutely does rely on creating unsafe inputs such as a multi-lane one-way street that encourages faster and more dangerous traffic. This is what's highlighted here in yellow on this image from today. The series of what I call one-way couplets that introduce this danger into the community being the primary determinant of crash severity, which is speed. So just how dangerous are speeding cars? Well, with higher speeds comes higher risk of death in a crash with a person walking. If a vehicle that collides with a person walking that person has a 75% chance of being killed if the vehicle's traveling at 48 miles an hour. That chance of being killed rises to 90% if that driver is doing 54.6 miles per hour. The table that you see here are the recorded speeds and were part of the big jump shared use path evaluation that tool design completed and illustrate just how dangerous this corridor is. Again, we can see how racist policies from the past can combine and underlie transportation decisions, which can contribute and influence and shape really our lives today. But, you know, the roadway was not always like this. Originally, it was designed as a two way two lane residential street with easy access from Druid Hill Park. Residents of Reservoir Hill could cross Druid Park Lake Drive on foot 
at multiple locations and enjoy the park or continue over to Wyman Park Drive Bridge into Remington. That top right image shows the multitude of access points that existed in 1927. We also see in the top left photo an early 1940s era um, photo where we still have a decent amount of pedestrian scale, but the 1948 expressway project would shift the balance away from people and access to commute times and speed. And more specifically, white commuters commute times and speed. With the connection to the newly created Interstate 83 in the 60s, we see that in the bottom right-hand corner, the transformation was complete and it reduced the available crossings to only four. Now, before we leave this slide, I wanna draw your attention to that red arrow. It points to a support column for a pedestrian bridge that's existing in a sea of highway scaled signage, which in a way, a perverse way that is an appropriate scale because we now have a highway linking to another highway smashed in between a neighborhood and its park. This image shows more clearly that pedestrian bridge over what would become the connection to Mount Royal Terrace as the construction of I-83's interchanges at 28th and 29th were being constructed. In 1964, highway infrastructure that considered the needs of people walking was rare. But does this really consider the needs of people? Is this really even pedestrian infrastructure? Closer examination reveals that it is not, especially not if you are a person who uses a wheelchair or other mobility aid. As one side of the bridge is a ramp, only to find that the other side has stairs. Even for folks that don't require mobility assistance, climbing up to simply go back down is annoying, and oftentimes all it does is force people into unsafe situations. This photo reveals the true purpose of infrastructure like this. It's to prioritize fast movement of cars over the movement of people. The inequity of inadequate pedestrian facilities in the Druid, Park, uh, the Druid Lake Park Drive corridor is compounded by the fact that a large percentage of households in the Reservoir Hill neighborhood are without access to a personal motor vehicle. This photo also shows us again how traces of racist policy decisions can translate through the built environment all the way through to today despite creating one of the more dangerous intersections of where the big jump shared use paths crossed the connection to Mount Royal Terrace, the decision was made to keep it available to motor vehicles. This is a prime example of where a professional who trains themselves to look closely at things and put thought into their spatial and historical context can be more effective at helping their client recognize the opportunity to dismantle inequities and even if it is only one small change at a time. Here we see where we were able to get the Mount Royal Terrace connection closed to motor vehicles and a much safer crossing established for the Big Jump shared use path users. Returning to this slide, the team at Unknown Studio is actively trying to dismantle the inequity of the one-way couplets and their faster traffic and increased hazard. One way to best accomplish this, in our opinion, is to stop feeding the system that it depends on. That system depends on these speedy one-way couplets. A more equitable solution would be restoring two-way op operations to some of these streets in yellow. And we can realize a drop in speed and safer crossings for people. But 
how might this look? By introducing a series of modern roundabouts, it means greater efficiency for drivers. Hey, no more waiting at signals and shorter and safer, hey, more visible crossings for people walking and biking. We can see how it decouples some of those yellow one-way couplets. Just returning quickly to the previous slide, we see how those streets split up the neighborhoods. Going back to a potential better way, it would restore this park road to its park context and enable people-centered access. It would right historical wrongs that favored white commuters in lieu of the local neighborhoods. It could return even the neighborhood streets back to the neighborhood. You know, it's, it's a big vision, but the intentionality of the damage of the past racist policies require an equal commitment and intentionality to correct it. That's my presentation for today. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. Thanks, Fred, that was very enlightening. Um, I guess, Kyle, do you wanna open it up to questions? Unmute everyone and... Don't be shy, I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had a question for you. Um, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, I am just curious, like in your experience, especially working on transit projects in Baltimore, what is the biggest challenge when it comes to like, just trying to change people's minds about divesting from car centric infrastructure <laughs> and uh, what strategies do you find are most effective for dealing with that? Great question. Um, lots of different ways to answer. Uh, I think the one of the most challenging things, you know, for for any uh, I think designer is that change is hard. <laughs> people are afraid of change, and some people. Um, have good reason to be, you know, and I think this presentation shows how a lot of times communities that were never included in the decision making process are going to be skeptical. Uh, communities that have not seen investment um, in years or ever can be concerned about what is coming at them. So I think really. Um, there's both understanding the needs of the community, really listening, hearing what they think about the space they live in, but there's also another side to it as well, and that's that's dealing with the the inertia, if you will, of some of the ra racist policies that have um, embedded themselves in the built environment, and I think. You know, as a good example, um, we set up our transportation system in such a way that we've now prioritized uh, car centric movements and even just adding in things like the big jump uh, introduces a lot of change. Um, the evaluation report that Tool Design did on the big jump found some pretty surprising things that. Um, were in contrast to initial popular opinion that it created a traffic nightmare. Um, what we found after analyzing the data was that in any you know, case, when you introduce something new to a roadway, people are gonna slow down and try and understand what's going on. So we took little samples at four different periods just to make sure we could 
see how things changed over time. And what we found was that once people were used to what was going on out there, the single lane of travel, um, commute times actually were not badly affected. In fact, traveling eastbound only took 30 seconds longer than it did before um, the introduction of the big jump. I have a question, Fred. This, it's kind of a, it's a little bit, off, well, it's not off topic, but you focus so much on Druid Park and I don't want to take away from that um, in Middle River, but or Middle Branch, but I'm just, I'm always been fascinated by Martin Luther King Boulevards because they're in every city, you know, um, mm -hmm. and yet they tend to be these, and you, you nailed it when you were talking about the highway to nowhere and this idea of like the bigger moves for some reason we just tend to ignore them because they're accepted like it's a you know it's this big boulevard and it's great infrastructure but it's totally divisive and um so i, I guess if, i don't know this may be beyond your purview but um if you could speak maybe to the just what what is what was the genesis behind you know creating all these mlk boulevards throughout every city and but then they become such a, a dividing line um and so is there any way to, is it just a matter of like renaming it or do you really have to rethink how you, how you mm -hmm. name, how you give labels to a, a road that is named after someone who was such a come together and it's actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A weird question. Well, I think, I think we'd first have to separate the naming and the, the roadway. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I think just doing that right off the bat, we, we can then allow ourselves to examine the road for uh, what it is uh, and how it's operating in the community um, and, and really who it's prioritizing. And I think that becomes uh, a little bit of a theme that's throughout this presentation, right, is who is the true beneficiary of the built environment that we are creating? And in Baltimore, um, I think MLK, the boulevard, uh, but not only that roadway, there's many um, of the radial streets that we have that, uh, and like I was talking about the one-way couplets where mm -hmm. the priority is not upon the community, is not the community that, that they are traveling through, it's really for the commuters. Um, and, and that, you know, as you dig into that a little bit more, it's like, well, why are we prioritizing commuters and not residents of the city? And that brings us back to some of these um, residential security map and uh, racist policies when it, with regards to housing. In, you know, 1948, the limits of the city's ability to annex Baltimore County were frozen in time uh, thanks to um, a state senator who was able to pass legislation that effectively said 50% of Baltimore County has to approve of any further annexations. And so as that locked in our borders for the city, that meant the city couldn't grow and, and acquire more tax base. Um, and that really then introduces a, a priority to uh, what land we do have in the city. And so filling it with things like parking lots and, and um, you know, catering to those who live outside the city but drive in mm -hmm. becomes questionable. Why do we do that? Um, they're not supporting the tax base, if you will. Um, yes, through businesses, but it's an interesting situation that as we scratch that surface further, we'll see that it's directly tied to uh, the suburbs and um, what is known as white flight, even though that's not the first wave of it after World War II, it actually began much earlier. Um, but that particular version of white flight allowed um, the suburbs to have racially restrictive uh, 
covenants and and that carried over into um an issue of class yes. fred <clears throat> excuse me fred uh this is laurel um first i wanted to say just thank you so much for a, a fantastic way to kick our kick off our fall the school's fall lecture series that was a tremendous tremendous presentation and it was, you know, it, it was timely in so many ways. Um, a number of students who are um, uh, are here this afternoon <clears throat> on the on the Zoom uh, are in a second year studio, um, working with me and Dan Campo, and they're going to be contributing to an equity of access study that uh, Dan and I are working on for Masonville Cove, oh. with the um, <clears throat> Maryland. Um, uh, Port Administration and also uh, the DOT and, and the partners at Masonville. And they'll be going out to Masonville Cove on uh, this Thursday for a site tour. So the timeliness of them seeing uh, your work um, on the middle branch and being able to sort of locate Masonville on your map. And then also what was so powerful, showing that map where you were showing the contiguous neighborhoods but then also saying just because these neighborhoods are contiguous doesn't necessarily mean that they're connected. And that was, that was a really great um, series of, of images um, that I'm sure that they um, took much from, even though that they were there for just a short period of time. Um, also, I just wanted to touch upon a couple of comments that you made. One is that, <clears throat> um, that, um, that there's different scales of resolution that we need to look at. Um, you were talking about the example of the scale of the sidewalk, but then also dollying back and sort of looking at the scale, just of, you were showing of South, uh, South, South Baltimore, that area by Middle Branch. So kind of um, like moving in and out and thinking about at different scales, there may be connections at certain scales, but those connections are broken or lost at different scales. I thought that was a really wonderful point. Um, I also wanted to say that, um, that the, um, the way that you organized your slides and having the side-by-sides and that amazingly effective use of that red arrow. Um, I'm sure that the students also really appreciated that. It, it, it was having these historic side-by-sides is one thing, but also providing a landmark or some sort of a de um, a, a reference point in those slides for us to focus our attention was really, Wonderful. And the last point that I wanted to make <clears throat> was about um, your emphasis on being keen observers. So many times the students are, are in a studio and 14 weeks, it seems at the outset, 14 weeks is a lot of time or 15 weeks or 13, even 13 weeks seems like a lot of time, um, but it does take some time to ramp up, right? To get your sea legs. Um, but also in our studios, Rarely do we have the opportunity that you are having with the Middle Branch projects and also the Druid, um, uh, the Druid Park project to work with a community, right? Because the 14 weeks, you certainly isn't enough time for, for that to be happening within a studio. So, um, so as a consequence, we need to be keen observers, right? We, and um, we don't have the opportunity to speak with necessarily people that are living in the neighborhoods, uh, but that doesn't stop us from, from um, uh, doing our best to be keen observers and, and focusing on what we are, we are training ourselves to be good at, which is to sort of understand the, um, um, the built environment, the built and natural environment, be able to sort of deconstruct them and then reconstruct them. So thank you for emphasizing that, and again, a really a wonderful, oh, there was one last thing. When I, um, uh, <clears throat> this actually is the last thing. When I uh, arrived at Morgan two and a half years ago, <clears throat> and uh, I understood for the, for the most part that the, the desire at Morgan was to have graduate programs. Um, when classes met in the evening, for the most part, city and regional planning, and I think maybe architecture too, they tend to have more evening classes than landscape. I was try to get our classes into the into more into some of the daylight. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I was noticing when I was looking at the meeting times for classes, I was looking, um, I was looking at the meeting times of classes, but I was also curious when the buses ran on um, on uh, Paring Parkway and also on Hill and Road. 
-hmm. And what I was noticing is that our classes, they went later than the buses. And so the, Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is that unless that you have access to a car or somebody to drop you off and pick you up, you're not really going to be able to uh, have that opportunity to study in the evening after your job because the buses don't run. And so on the one hand, we tried to do something within the university offering classes that would, that would expand access to maybe some degree programs. There, that, needed to be, that needs to be done too with some, some understanding of, well, how are folks actually going to be able to um, uh, arrive or, or participate in these classes? And um, so that was a bit of a, a, a frustration. I don't, I don't know if you've encountered similar things um, at, like that. I know the students who are studying with Kathy Poole, they're studying um, Hillside Park over on Falls Road are also studying the bus systems and s- the access that's available or not uh, to different places based on for public transit. Oh, absolutely. Transit is a huge concern in Baltimore City. Um, you know, the history of our, our transit service, um, the fact that it's, we're this major metropolitan uh, area that, that does not have uh, control over its transit. It's, it's controlled by the state. Um, and it's something that we're exploring and looking into with the Druid Hill project. Um, you know, there, there is no transit to the interior of the park. And, and there's actually a, a couple of different voices and opinions on that. Um, part of it is a, uh, a, a great desire to have more um, transit that takes you into the interior. Uh, another aspect is concern that uh, when they do have large um, events like AFRAM, um, that MTA is uh, not going to adjust their schedules or adjust their routing to su- be supportive of it. So uh, lots of hard work needs to be done. But the, you know, the bright spot, at least for Baltimore City, is that we've recently adopted uh, the Baltimore Complete Streets Manual. And this is a very important manual for our city because it um, it really sets a whole new priority, a whole new modal hierarchy, as it's called, um, for what gets prioritized. Um, in a lot of ways, people people think of complete streets as being um, kind of a buffet of options that you apply to a street. And that's not actually a a good way of thinking of it. A better way of thinking of complete streets is it's a guidebook for prioritizing how to use limited space and where certain contexts support a more uh, pedestrian focus or a maybe a more industrial focus, but always with inside of this greater context of the modal hierarchy that prioritizes people and transit over the single occupant use vehicle. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have a question. Um, I just first wanted to say I loved your presentation. Um, Baltimore transportation history is one of my special interests, and so oh, thank you. I, yeah, so it's, it's just it's a your presentation is a really great resource, um, and um, yeah, I have so many questions for you, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll probably reach out to you outside of this. Um, sure, but for you know a more generalized you know question that's you know that I that I'm curious about is um, if you could tell us um, if you had the opportunity to redesign the highway to nowhere and get rid of it Mm -hmm. and completely transform that awful cut in the city's fabric, um, what would you do? What would you like to implement? (laughs) Well, that one, um, you know, honestly, that is just such a huge tear in the urban fabric, but more importantly, a tear in the community, 
right? And the people who lived there and the, and the people whose homes existed in that space. So um, I think there's a lot of things that uh, can be done and, and just um, thinking about it in isolation can lead you down the wrong path sometimes. And so really understanding how whatever the solution might be is connected to the rest of the city and how it supports connections and supports people is where I go first. And um, trying to really understand it as a part of a system. Now, uh, there's been proposals for that space, of course, that I'm sure you might be aware of with the um, poorly named red line, but uh, what would have been a fantastic amenity for the city when I'm talking about the east to west light rail that that was um, supposed to be uh, getting underway and was canceled by the governor um, with virtually no reason, no legitimate reason. Um, so, um, you know, there is an idea, uh, but I think trying to address that loss of community has to be a part of it as well. And, um, and then of course, you get into issues of cost and all of that, but um, I really like thinking right from the get-go is how is this going to connect? You know, where are our connection points and, and what do they do for us? That's really great. I was going to say, I remember it was about 10 years or so ago that they had closed the highway to nowhere for quite a bit of time. And it was amazing how the traffic impact was like zero on Franklin and Mulberry streets. It was pretty phenomenal how little impact, like it, you would almost like you would never know. And you're right that the, you know, that it's part of a bigger thing. And you know, really trying to figure out how to, you know, repair those communities and stuff. Thank you. Of course. Um, I just noticed that Eli Poussin just put in the chat um, something as a short plug uh, for Central Maryland Transportation Alliance's uh, 101, a uh, transportation 101 training program. And he's got a link in there. Uh, so everyone should check that out. It's a really worthwhile uh event and organization. Um, and if you're interested in these topics, that's, that's definitely something to check out. Thanks, Eli. Anyone else questions for Fred? Well, I was curious, Fred, was there a turning point in your career that uh, because your work does mm -hmm. the few the the times that that I've been on reviews with you the focus has been on transportation is there uh, you mentioned John Stilgo early <laughs> in your presentation but was there was there something that you studied with Stilgo or was there a was there a moment um, just curious um, <laughs> how how sometimes our careers find us we don't find them. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think there, um, uh, <laughs> part of the answer might be uh, in the recession, um, being able to spend a lot more time exploring and and getting out there and observing and, um, and you know, mentioning John Stilgo, one of his books that I absolutely adore and I think everyone should read is Outside Lies Magic. Um, and that, that book really talks about observing your environment and, and being, uh, interested in it. And so, um, at the time I was, I was living in Portland and Seattle and biking in those cities was an amazing experience. Um, and, and actually something still go recommends, uh, in terms of exploring as opposed to using a car. Right. You go too fast in a car. Um, you're removed from your, your environment. In fact, uh, uh, J.B. Jackson talks about bicycles as well and, and um, has a wonderful quote about that. Uh, I won't butcher it though. <laughs> um, 
uh, but essentially he he talks about that how you're not removed from your environment while riding a bike and so I think from that experience it gets you thinking about these connections and you start scratching at the surface and and wondering well why is it that way why do all these streets along green mount ave have do not enter why can't what's what's so you know special in there that that we can't go in there and i think what's interesting about that is that it's yeah you know it seems very um uh like easy answer and you could walk away like, oh, right, we don't want cut through traffic. But where does that traffic go? And, and why do they not get cut through traffic when the other side does? Um, and so starting to understand how all these pieces fit together, you start to um, uh, find, as you say, your, maybe your career ends up finding, <laughs> finding you. Um, I... I did work on quite a bit of um, transportation projects like the um, Seattle's light rail uh, on some station design and things like that. And, and just again, further that idea that going, you know, and getting everywhere by car maybe isn't the best thing. And wait a minute, I can actually do a lot with this bike, uh, especially if I get a set of panniers and, can carry things and it becomes uh, very liberating in a way. It's, it's, it's very interesting because back when I was in Arizona, we had a uh, master's in environmental planning program and a number of our students traveled, on, uh, traveled to school on bikes. And one of the students for their thesis, um, <clears throat> they actually uh, started or they contributed significantly to the to a movement mm -hmm. in uh, Arizona or in Phoenix to get bikes on buses, you know, those rigs in the front of buses. So the students mm -hmm. could then commute um, and they could uh, uh, put their bike in the front of the bus, like that rig, um, it's an out, outboard in the front mm -hmm. and then they could get to campus and then they have their, their bike on campus and then they just flip it around and, and do it on the way home. But you know, for the, for the, for the students that there are, there are master's projects and theses hiding in plain sight <laughs> right here and probably in, in your, in your everyday routines. Um, if you, if you are open up to them. Thank you again. Thank you. Any last questions? We've got a couple of minutes left before five. Not so much a question. I just wanted to throw out something that you had asked about earlier, Laurel, um, in, about MLK Boulevard. And what's really interesting about that is that it wasn't, it was originally in the planning documents named City Boulevard. So the name for MLK came later. And I don't know exactly how or why they arrived at that name, but it's interesting that that wasn't the name from the get go. Oh, and it's interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. And also, one other thing <laughs> um, that, um, just lost my shoes thought bus Morgan. So I worked on Baltimore link and, um, mm -hmm. when I was an intern at MTA and when I worked for um, a consultant for MTA and getting the bus over the getting this, I actually really like lobbied to get the silver bus over to Morgan. <laughs> there mm -hmm. was, you know, because that wasn't there before. And the hardest thing about being a transit planner was that you have all these great ideas and the funding and the resources mm. aren't there. And it was very hard even because Baltimore Link came out of the um, a previous plan, the bus network improvement project under Governor O'Malley. And even under his administration, they just like, <laughs> they, it was this, it was this very, it was like pulling teeth, right? To get this plan implemented. They had this really long amount of phases, most of which were going to be outside of his administration. So only like the first two, I think it was the first two got implemented. And so then the new administration came in and Governor Hogan, who, as we know, canceled the red line and did not see the, and did not 
want to put the funding that BNIP required. So that's where Baltimore Link kind of, you know, rose out of. And it's very, it was exciting to finally get the bus near Morgan and to have it have some hours. (laughs) And it was, but it was, it's still so hard to be like, you know, you know that it needs, there needs to be so much more and just the Mm -hmm. resources. And as you mentioned, um, Fred about the, um, about, um, stuttering here um the um resources the timing i lost my train of thought but something along those lines and um yeah so yes Hmm. well i think you're right resources are always the uh yeah roadblock right (laughs) the state that's what it was but you had mentioned about how how it's under the state administration and not mm-hmm. locally. And I think that that plays a huge role. Yeah, that's very too. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's For, something to, to, to look into. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, because obviously depending on who's at the state level, you right. know, like mm-hmm. Governor Hogan doesn't live in Baltimore. So his, you know, mm-hmm. like, so if the administration is not, is not focused on Baltimore, then that is a huge disadvantage. Well, we can also think about, you know, again, at the granular level, as as Fred was talking about, you know, looking at the designs of sidewalks or zooming in, um, it's people are going to think, well, she's fixating on pairing parkway. But looking at the location of Sevis, for instance, I mean, this is a barrier. This is a barrier for some students who want to study the built environment. And where we study the built environment is at Sevis. But if we look at the, uh, the boundary, along Pairing Parkway near Sebus, we've got a, con- a continuous wall with very few breaks in it. And there just may be one, there may be one stop on the bus, I'm not sure, but uh, the bus doesn't come into the campus there. So it may actually not be, um, it's not generous. I guess that would be, it's just, it seems stingy and it just isn't a generous way, um, you know, that, it's, 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 it's introducing barriers um, where we, I think we have some agency maybe to, um, to remove some of those barriers if we could. I agree. And <laughs> something I learned when I was working, when I worked as a planner for the parking authority of Baltimore city, um, amazingly mm-hmm. is the, is that sidewalks. Now this is, this is just a thing I learned in general knowledge through a transport, through a transportation um, committee meeting with city council is that um, th- that sidewalks in Baltimore City, <laughs> the person who, so you know how roads are paid for and maintained you know, via taxes mm-hmm. and through the Department of Transportation. If you live on a street and the sidewalk is in really poor condition and you want the city to fix it, the city bills you. 50%. So, yeah, so it's a perver- perverse incentive that if you can't, aff- you know, you can't afford to pay for the sidewalk, that you're not going to want it to get fixed. And then it just is a huge disservice to everyone. And there's just so many barriers like that. And it's just really heartbreaking. Well, this was a, a wonderful discussion. And as Mara said, a great start to the lecture series. If I think a million for being our not guinea pig, but you know, jumping off and this big splash. Um, so this is wonderful. And following, just for all of you following this, um, good twist of fate. Um, next Tuesday, so October fifth at three o'clock, um, we'll be having the Middle Branch Fellowship um, presentations from five students who participated in the fellowship this summer. And so it's a nice kind of segue from Fred's discussion on Middle Branch to the Middle Branch Fellowship. So um, again, it starts at three um, and it will go till five. So it's a little bit earlier start. So thanks a million. Um, if any of you have questions for Fred, you can always email me and I can maybe give you Fred's email. <laughs> Impossible. But thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thanks, Fred. And thank you all for having me. This was fantastic. Have a good afternoon. Bye.